Cole, we're here at the Whirly Gig booth. Yes, we are. Is this the first year that you guys have been boothing as a dedicated company, or have uh, you had Whirly Gig booths at other cons? This is the very first year. You know, when we were first starting, uh, we had a friend who had a small booth at Gen Con, and we did sell him some copies of Premiere so we could <laughs> say that we were on the floor. But we've never done it just because it's, it's a lot of work, and uh, my brother Drew really wanted to have a booth. And I said, look, this is like a part-time job you're volunteering for. Right, right. And he was like, I'm going to do it. I want to do it to the nines. I said, I'm empowering you to do it. I will help you, but this is yours. And he has had such a fun time putting together this whole, this whole thing. What kind of pressure does that put on you as, you know, a representative of Leader Games and Whirly Good Games? Are you like bouncing back and forth all the time? It means that there is no downtime at this particular <laughs> yep. con. And I, I think it's the kind of thing that like we will not be doing often, but we've had a lot of fun so far. And it means that, you know, as soon as I finish here, I'm running across the hall to Leader. Well, we're at the Molly House demo table. The prototype looks absolutely gorgeous. It's getting a lot of interest. Even as we were getting ready for this interview, like 15 people stopped to be like, what is this game? Um, but also, you're right on the heels of uh, John Company's massive success. Congratulations, man. Thank you so much. I don't know if we brought enough copies. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's moving very fast. Uh, um, shut up and sit down. Did a, did a real number on that one a couple days ago. Yeah, I was getting on the plane and I was about to set my phone to airplane mode. And moments before that, I got a text message from Drew that said, Shove and Sit Down just posted a video. It's 50 minutes long. And I said, I'm, my plane is taking <laughs> off. Uh, and he's like, okay, we'll watch it together. And so he had to drive five hours alone in a car without having seen it. And so the whole time we just thought like, oh, I, I wonder what it's going to be like. I mean, I, I love any kind of engagement with, with board games, right? right. And so even if it's a negative review or it doesn't like that is so secondary just to it's an engagement with something that you've worked on and cared about and one thing i like absolutely love about um about how that video is done is the it's an exceptionally good video I right, mean, I, right. I think it says very kind things about john company but also it is just like a master class in like long form video content the conversation around the video has been about the state of discourse of video um, essays in board games, right. which is a great subject. And so I, I get to feel like honored to be like a little footnote in this larger conversation yeah. about like, how do we talk about video games, about board games in the video space? Totally, totally. And, and also there, there's the important conversations that are happening around the subject matter of the game, which I think is part of the intentionality, right? Yeah, like when sure. you make games like PAX Premier, like John Company, like Molly House, you're thinking about like, you want this to start conversations about the subject matter, right? Right, right, absolutely. I mean, these are, every game is met as a player's first step in a wider world of understanding, which is why, you know, all of our rule books at the end of them, they're basically lists of books that we want people to read. And I didn't want to scare someone away with just a list of books. So they're written out as like, hey, you should like start with this one. I wanted to be like an older brother giving their sibling like a big pile of CDs. Right, And say right. like, hey, if you like that <laughs> song, like check out all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's fun too, because I think the, the, their video also serves that. Right. That, that, that format. So I know about some of the history and inspiration for Pax Premier, and I also know about some of the history and inspiration for John Company, and I see the easy transition from so many games about colonialism in a kind of benign whitewash sort of way uh, that it makes it a very interesting thing to capture in a very thoughtful way. But I know almost nothing about the subject matter and history involved in Molly House. So what was the big inspiration point for you? So Molly House, the original design was done by this, a designer named Joe Kelly, who I mentored for the Zenobia Award, which is an initiative to bring uh, designers from traditionally underrepresented groups into the hobby. And as that we were working on Molly House together, I said, look, I love this theme. And I, I think this could be a really amazing design. After the contest is done, if you want to work with me on it, I'm happy to help you. And I, and I said right at the start, like, you should know, one, um, I don't know what that means. Like, <laughs> we've never published a, a design by another designer. Right. Uh, Drew and I go very slow. Like, I've been working on this game for two or three years. And, uh, and also, I'm a very full contact developer. And I, I said, look, I might be that I work as an editor or play tester or developer, or maybe we're gonna end up designing this thing together. Uh, but if you wanna try to feel out that experience with me, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be a good partner. And that has evolved into a wonderful collaboration, which I actually loved 
Uh, so one thing that we, this is Joe's first game. And so I was like, look, I don't want to play like the I'm a desi established designer card ever. Right, right, right. So I said, you have all the executive authority. You can always say no, and I want you to treat me as your like eager intern or understudy. And every Monday when we or Friday when we have a meeting, I'm going to try to impress you with the work that I've done. But you get to say I want to include it or I don't want to include it. And it's been an amazing collaboration. Uh, so Molly House is a game about these things called Molly Houses, which existed in the early part of the 18th century in London, which were basically gatherings of what today we might call like queer communities in London. It's a fascinating subject because. Uh, a lot of queer history has been completely erased from the record. Yeah. But we actually know a lot about Molly Houses because they were found out by bribed informers who basically turned over all their accounts and testimonies of what was happening in the Molly Houses into the public record um, and into this thing called the Society for the Reformation of Manners, which That's sounds like something like, you know, out of a uh, Harry Potter or something. Right, right, right. right, it's, right. Like, yeah. it's, like, it's, it's like two spot on the nose. Yeah. I, shouldn't say, I should say just like a YA novel. Um, but it, it, it's also like, I mean, I love it because it's a game about community and emergent alliances and, and partnerships and play, and also about the emergence of policing right. in the modern context. So even though, like, I mean, I think about John Company to me is a game about the origins of empire. This to me is the origins of the domestic empire. You right, know, like, right. What does it mean to police the morality and ideology of like an early modern nation? Yeah. And it, it looks like Molly House, right? So so even though the games are very different, they also have a lot of say, the same DNA. So what do you think is like the killer mechanical feature of the game that sure. really attracted to it as a game design, not just a theme? I think it does two things really, really well. The first thing that it does is players are collaboratively building poker hands together. So it has this interesting card mechanism where you're throwing these parties, everybody's tossing out cards, and only the best party is gonna score but you're having to like collaboratively work to build a set. So yeah. you're never building sets by yourself. It's about generating joy together. The other thing I love about it is it's a hidden trader game, but it's fully opt-in. So sometimes hidden trader games can feel very silly because you like go to a murder mystery party and you, you'd never go to a party where you knew someone was gonna be murdered. Right. So right, they're always right. like a little stilted. But in this game, uh, it's possible that everyone around the table has turned an informer and they're all informing on the Molly houses. It's possible that no one has. It's fully opt-in and it creates this like narrative ex range that you don't usually see in hidden trader games. And so those two elements from a game design standpoint, I think are fascinating. What is the discussion that you want people to have after they play this game? Kind of like we were talking about colonialism and John Company. Yeah, yeah. well, I want people to think a lot about um, their own communities. Where are the places in their life that they're finding joy and finding fellowship? And then think about how that is both quite different and quite similar to this period, right? So whenever we really get the past, I always want us to be looking for the moments of similarity, but also really appreciating the moments of difference and the ways in which they can see their own life reflected in the past, but also other lives that, that could have been, right? right. I, mean, I, I had, uh, someone wrote me a very nasty comment uh, about um, being upset that we were covering queer history because it was, it, was, it was someone else's history. And I said, no, like, look, I know, like, you're a bigot, let's say, <laughs> the, the person who wrote this comment, um, but your bigotness doesn't stop queer history from being part of your own history. Right, right, like, totally. You're a person uh, living today and your history is also tangled up in this history. Absolutely. And so you, there's a lot that can be gained from like stepping into someone's shoes and walking around this. And like, look, I'm not a queer person and I've learned so much from working with Joe and so much from just trying to immerse myself in the scholarship and the primary record. Yeah, and the, there's tons of intersectionality. I think uh, people can see um, whatever uh, oppressed, uh, you know, communities that are formed yeah. that, that there's bigotry around um, even if they're not queer themselves. Uh, so I, I am ecstatic that this game is getting published and you guys publish some of the most beautiful productions in the business. But I gotta talk about the leader game side of things. Sure. What's going on with ARCs at the convention? Are, are you showing it over yeah. at Leader? You can see it on the table right now. That's like a very late stage production copy. We don't quite have the factory copies yet, but we have like the step right before. Oh, that's um, amazing. We are submitting the final files for ARCs next week or the week after the game is done. Uh, I'm so happy with it. The studio has never made anything as big. We did an art audit and learned that like the game has more art than anything that we've ever done before. Mechanically, it's like Root plus Oath 
in terms of the back end complexity. Right. But at the same time, it's so approachable. And I think if, if it's any, I think it's going to be a lot of people's first leader game, and I think it's going to blow their minds. I'm I'm so excited for that game. Like I, I like everyone, you know. I just want to get it to the table. But you know, like I talked to your uh, colleague Nick recently uh, for yeah. uh, the show, and one of the things I talked to him about was that you guys are so transparent about sure. the development process way early on. And I have the question about like how does that impact the the way that he develops and designs games yeah. and is he as transparent as say you or Patrick are? And I think that's one of the reasons why everyone is waiting with bated breath at, at games like Arcs or, or before it, because we saw it come to fruition. But you as a designer, how does that impact your like creative vision to have comment and input and everyone outside of the actual design space reacting to your game sure. in progress? It's, I mean, it can be exhausting. Right. right. I mean, I like. There were a lot of days where I booted up arcs and thought, "Oh God, there are a thousand messages in the playtesting Discord <laughs> yes. that I need to read." But it also it, it makes you realize that games are part of a conversation. Yep. And I, you know, I, I think about my favorite part of my job is when I work on a game. I'm trying to contribute a, into this conversation about what games might be, and including playtesters and players in the process of creation is just one way to have that conversation. So it absolutely transforms uh, my, my method. It makes all the games better. Um, and the, the biggest challenge is that you have to preserve your own voice and sensibility as you're listening to all the feedback. So like, we take a lot of feedback, but we also don't like listen to all of it. And, and I think it's, it's equally important to listen, to hear the feedback, but not to to, to disagree with it. Right. And right. so, a lot of my time on the playtesting Discord, as playtesters know, is arguing with, with playtesters. <laughs> um, and and I think learning how to navigate that can be really trying. And everybody at the company uh, handles it differently. Right. Yeah. I think when when Patrick shares designs, he is looking for something very different than when Nick shares his designs, and certainly from what, what I share my, my designs. Right. Um, and and I think. This is also our way of kind of paying forward um, our own reliance on crowdfunding and our own uh, attempt of making the game making process as communal and as sensitive to the audience as it possibly can be. Well, you're burning the candle at both ends here by being at both booths, and I could talk to you for a million years about all this stuff, but there's one more topic that I wanted to talk about, and you kind of already broached on it with the Zenobia Awards. Shout out to Zenobia Awards. If you're not aware of that, then you should definitely look into that. I'll have links uh, in the comments here. Uh, however, uh, just historical games in general. Yeah. Outside of Whirly Gig, what are the historical games that you are most excited about right now that are coming out this year or early next year that people should keep their eyes on? We are in a great place in historical games. They've never been as good as they are right now. Uh, I am so excited by uh, Mark Herman's upcoming Civil War games that he's doing for GMT based on his Waterloo system. They are very nerdy. It's all <laughs> Hex Encounter, but they're so beautifully done. But I'm also been, I've been really impressed with GMT's desire to build out the space. Right. They're publishing a really interesting game about uh, the history of India in the medieval period. I can't wait to play it. They've been doing more games about politics and social things. One of my most anticipated title is non-breaking spaces cross, cross Bronx Expressway. I'll have to check it out. Um, it's incredible. It's a game about the building of roads through New York and gentrification. It's awesome. Uh, and then I, you know, I love the work that Amabel's doing, Allenspiel, of course. I'm, I've got Douda is our product, her new game about the tobacco industry, is on my way to my house right now. <laughs> and then uh, lastly, I'll just shout out uh, Fort Circle, Votes for Women, one of the most beautiful productions last year. Yeah, absolutely. That game is one of my favorites, just period, yeah, uh, great. Uh, of historical games. I mean, Shores of Tripoli was great already, and then yeah. Votes for Women is, as a follow-up was just, You man. love to see a strong first game. You, I mean, you love to see a strong sophomore album. Right. I mean, I always think right. about, like, the sophomore slump's real, but someone who can nail their second game, they're a publisher to watch. Yep. All right. Well, Cole, thank you so much for taking the it's time to pleasure, talk with Jeff. me. Thank you for watching. And I guess we'll uh, have more cool. discussions with Cole in the future and years to come. I, I can't wait for him, Jack. And now we're going to fill up this demo table. All right. Sounds Go. good. All right.